Our next speaker is Dr. Parashur uh, Natesh Parashurama. He's an assistant professor in the School of Engineering and Medicine at the State University of New York in Buffalo, and he will be speaking to us about the current state of liver stem cells and regenerative medicine research, an update, and implications. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure uh, being here today. Thank you for staying on this Saturday afternoon. I know you guys are uh, getting a lot of information, so my intention is just to present more ideas, uh, I, hopefully less on too much terminology. This talk is intended for the patients and the audience. I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me and also uh, the Vias family uh, from Toronto who uh, got me involved in this uh, society last year. This is my second time here. I'm very excited. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about our work with uh, stem cell research. So I see it now, uh, having come to the talks today, as an as an in between uh, something like organ transplantation and something like medical therapy that we just heard a lot of great talks on today. So I think this is a little bit uh, in the future overall as a talk, but I. I did my best to uh, place up-to-date literature, up-to-date work with stem cells to get people excited that, uh, and also I'm, I'm betting my career on stem cells, so I do feel that these uh, will be going into patients in the upcoming years. Different approaches and different strategies. So uh, I have very interdisciplinary training um, as a, in bioengineering, clinical medicine, uh, tissue engineering, and stem cells and imaging technology. I'm not gonna be talking about imaging today, and uh, to be honest, I run my own lab now, and, and so I'm on my own, I have my lab, so uh, hopefully you guys are on my team. It's once you have your own lab, I'm, I'm not doing clinical uh, care anymore. It's really a, a kind of a you, you're on your own, you run your own group, so uh, I hope to continue to interact with you for new ideas, new suggestions on this talk. I'd love to get emails from you, which I did a lot last year as well. So one of the major goals of our lab is to take uh, patients like uh, uh, many of whom are here today uh, with the diagnosis of primary sclerosis and cholangitis who are perhaps more advanced and think about ways we can use uh, human stem cells uh, and develop uh, liver cells and cholangiocytes and figuring out how we can develop new liver tissue in these patients. That's literally what we talk about and think about every day in the lab. So as you can see, this is a very direct approach. We'll talk about how any of the patients here could be donors for stem cells, uh, I'm gonna talk about it and hopefully remove any uh, ideas people have, may have, ethical issues related to stem cells and things like that as well. So very briefly, you've been seeing a lot of pictures of liver today. I just don't want you to forget the microarchitecture that we would need to restore if we restore liver functions in patients who are more advanced towards uh, irreversible fibrosis and cirrhosis. Uh, this is at the micro scale, so you have liver cells, supporting cells, vascular, uh, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, immune cells in the blood, and then you have these little junctions here which end up joining together into these green structures draining the bile. So the bile in this picture is coming out of the page uh, draining into big ducts. So microarchitecture, what I like to call macroarchitecture, were all things that we need to think about if we want to use stem cells to build healthy liver tissue in a patient with uh, pronounced uh, fibrosis or cirrhosis. I put this picture here at the bottom. I think there have been a lot of talks now on uh, different aspects of the biliary system that are affected in primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Uh, in, this, in the world of science where I'm working right now, uh, up to this point, uh, the hilus of the liver and beyond is considered extrahepatic, extrahepatic biliary ducts. And, and these branches here are joining uh, with this picture up here at these junctions called portal triad. So everything beyond the hilum is generally considered intrahepatic biliary ducts. And the biology is slightly different, the markers are slightly different, and I think there's already been quite a bit of discussion today, but that's something we also need to think about if we wanted to build liver tissue in a, in a patient with liver disease. This is another picture of the architecture, which is quite interesting, I'd be happy to go over that in details later. And I'm actually stealing a picture also from the Mayo Clinic that was used earlier in a talk to show normal structure of the liver and biliary strictures that might occur in cholangitis, uh, uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, as well as the, um, as well as the uh, cirrhosis that's occurring around it. So this could be termed biliary cirrhosis 
as, a, as opposed to other types of cirrhosis, but the result is scarring. Uh, I have a picture later showing about uh, the scars in the liver, and as a, as a person uh, based in regenerative medicine, we're trying to think how can we rebuild that tissue. Um, these are the various functions of the liver that have already been discussed today. Uh, immune uh, synthesis of proteins, metabolism, obviously endocrine functions, drug metabolism, exocrine functioning, including the bioproduction, and uh, actually 500 known functions of the liver. So uh, we already heard a lot about organ transplantation today, but from my point of view as the scientist, the type of science that I do, we could kind of look at the limitations of organ transplantation and use it as a way to rationalize why we need stem cells. So I'm not here to criticize organ transplantation. I think it's an amazing operation. In fact, that was my plan to, in my career to be a liver transplant surgeon, and now I do stem cell research. So it's uh, very expensive. Uh, some of the patients I talked about, I talked, uh, sat down at the table with them yesterday morning. They told me how expensive their particular transplant was uh, through the Kaiser system here in California. So we could argue that the transplantation is expensive, so we need cheaper solutions. We've heard today about donor-related issues. Um, so there's a limited number of donors. Uh, you can imagine globally, you can never have enough donors for all the patients. And I think that's, um, you know, the term is donor scarcity, but it's kind of a rationalized medicine where we're deciding who's sick and who's not. So we don't want that in the future. We want a, a limit, unlimited availability of tissues. Variability we've heard about today, quality we've heard about today. Uh, many of you guys have personal experiences with this, and I'm just reading off a slide. So. I look forward to continuing to talk to you tonight about this. Um, immunosuppression for a lifetime. So these are not ideal solutions. So hopefully uh, the things I talk about with you today are gonna be address all of these issues. Uh, in theory, every single one of them. So uh, a lot of people know the liver regenerates. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done towards liver regeneration. Even now, uh, there are factors, uh, scientists believe, uh, proteins that can be injected that could promote liver regeneration. Liver regeneration involves, if you remember the pictures I just showed you, not only the major cells, the hepatocytes, but also all the supporting cells. So we know, uh, as I'll show here, in, in mouse models, in mouse, rats, and transplant surgeons know this in humans. If you, do, if you take out about two-thirds of the liver in a week to a month of time, depending mouse versus rat model, the entire uh, liver tissue is grown back to the same exact mass from which uh, you started. So this is an amazing thing in nature. Of course, we know this in the history of uh, Greek literature, the story of Prometheus. So liver regeneration has been known for a long time. The question is how can we use that to our advantage? We, have, we cannot use it yet for chronic liver diseases such that, that I was mentioning the biliary cirrhosis in that case, the regenerative mechanisms uh, scientists have found are completely lost. The, um, I'm actually gonna get back to this picture on the bottom in a second. So what happens is the only evidence of any regeneration in cirrhosis, to my understanding, we have several hepatologists here who can um, um, you know, help me out here, but regenerative nodules that form in the pathology of cirrhosis are uh, believed to be by scientists some effort of the liver cells to be regenerating but unfortunately, this is not normal liver architecture. So most, uh, most of the people in, in, in the area of cirrhosis pathologists believe uh, the cells cannot re no longer regenerate. However, I will mention, especially in chronic liver disease, they've lost the capacity. Um, however, uh, the idea of regeneration has been used in animals, not only in mice, but actually in pigs as a technology, as a genetic technology, where now you can uh, breed transgenic animals that can uh, be where the, the normal liver cells are injured and you can transplant hepatocytes into them and now all of a sudden you can have a mouse walking around with human liver cells. And I think it hasn't been talked about yet so far at this meeting, but it's quite valuable for drug development and things like that. Now there's no equivalent of this for a mouse or even a pig walking around with human biliary cells, but it should be able to be done uh, based on the same basis. So for the purposes of time, I'll just mention this model to you that I think is quite interesting. We, the, the limitation of this model, I believe, can also be addressed with our stem cell research. The limitation of these models, so let's imagine even in patients, 
I can develop a way to do a gene therapy to the liver and injure the liver cells and put in fresh ones and they will go and replace the injured liver. And that's not that uh, crazy of an idea because we do lots of gene delivery uh, trials for liver disease. In the past, the, actually we have nice vectors that go to the liver. However, in these livers where, um, that have been replaced, all the supporting tissues are still not of human origin, they're still of mouse origin. So in the case of a patient where if we ever invented something like this, the supporting tissues, we still need to figure out how to do it. And I believe stem cells can still address that issue. So I just uh, keep bring this aware that we can use regeneration for certain tools, but not yet for cirrhosis. So just to quickly summarize, I think it's uh, generally limited to, think, limit, uh, limited to think about regeneration for advanced liver disease. Um, there are some approaches uh, with transplantation where they take advantage of it. But in general, thinking about how to uh, regenerate biliary side of things is still lacking in the field. Cell therapy is something that I've been very passionate about for a long time. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to spend a decent amount of time on this today as quickly as I can just to give people a feel that there are other options that have been tested in uh, academic centers that are it's not necessarily a medication and it's not necessarily an organ transplant. So <clears throat> adult cells, so this is, we're not even talking about pluripotent stem cells yet, which we'll get into in a second, but uh, adult cells can be derived from donors again. And these could be from adult or fetal donors. They could be from livers uh, or tissues like bone supporting tissues. And here I've listed a wide range of cells that have been used in clinical trials. Uh, mature hepatocytes have been used to uh, obtain from a donor and transplant back to a, 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 a patient with liver disease. However, there's other cell types that are actively being tested right now. Liver stem cells is a controversial field. We believe that's partially related to the ability of the liver to regenerate itself. So this, uh, these cells have been used in mouse models, animal models. These are being used in clinical trials right now in Italy. It's called human biliary tree stem cells. Very controversial topic, but some scientists believe within the biliary tract, there's small numbers of cells that can regenerate the biliary duct. Now, considering in PSC, uh, there's a lack of growth, atrophy, stricture, you, one could argue that these cells might be quite interesting. And these are some uh, clinical trials, which I didn't go too much into today, but I can provide information on being used in Italy right now for chronic liver disease. These cells are extremely safe, mesenchymal stem cells and bone marrow stem cells. To be honest, around 2001, these were the cells that started the buzz in stem cell research, which, and, a, and a bug which I caught eventually with my career. So this was uh, data for several different organ systems, including liver, where if you take bone marrow derived cells that are very safe, inject them back into a patient, sometimes you can get them from the same patient grow them up and go back into the patient, they could have strong anti-inflammatory effects and very, very safe. So mesenchymal stem cells, and there's another one called mononu bone mononuclear cells, are cells that have, are very safe. Now, uh, there have been a lot of studies, which I'll show, with uh, kind of mixed effects in various liver diseases. I believe uh, none of these have been used in primary sclerosis and cholangitis for various reasons including the fact that we're still figuring out the pathophysiology. So human hepatocytes have been used for pediatric metabolic liver diseases. Uh, the liver stem cells uh, the, uh, have been used in mouse models, a still unclear benefit. The biliary tree stem cells I just told you about are not widely used. Uh, the mesenchymal stem cells and other bone marrow stem cells have had uh, uh, mild benefits and uh, unknown mechanisms. So I've listed here, just so people know, there's been quite a few uh, hepatocyte cell uh, therapy trials up to about the year 2000. It still continues in specialized centers, but the same issues there that you need, that uh, the donor is required, and the same issues that exist for organ transplantation would also exist for this problem. Obtaining these liver cells, purifying them. Uh, the big thing with liver cells is they don't grow in the culture dish, so I can't expand them. So if I get 10 cells from the donor, I can only inject 10 cells into the patient. So um, I talk about that a little bit later uh, in today's talk. So just to, just to give the flavor that these have been used for a variety of metabolic diseases, not necessarily primary sclerosis and cholangitis with some benefits um, in uh, pediatric patients. 
Uh, this is an example of New England Journal Medicine article where they used hepatocytes for a, a rare syndrome as well and showed an improved benefit. This is some data from a, a, a review out of Mayo Clinic showing um, uh, the results of mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs, and various bone marrow stem cell trials. Um, these are the ones that I was mentioning are very safe, anti-inflammatory. Um, however, as mixed results, you don't see a huge potent benefit. You do see it in animal models, but they have not seen it in patients yet. So I would say this is a continuing active area of research. Um, some scientists are figuring out, uh, you can imagine uh, the challenge in this field, uh, there's many people in the stem cell field who are working on this, trying to figure out if we develop liver cells or biliary cells and we inject them in livers using different ways, um, how are they going to even survive or engraft? And so some uh, scientists of uh, actually the University of Minnesota have worked on ways to try to improve the engraftment of the cells themselves. So there's um, Perhaps we can use radiation. You can actually use previous surgery to improve engraftment, radiation, um, ways of manipulation, the, manipulating the blood vessels to try to improve engraftment of cells. And um, you know, this again is something that's been worked on very actively, preclinical and clinical as well. So in summary, I think I've made the main points here that cell transplantation is, to me, a still exciting field but the source of the cells and uh, getting the cells to stay alive and figuring out the right uh, clinical target to for which we're using cells is very critical. And generally, these things have been used for other liver diseases, but not necessarily the chronic fibrosis, cirrhosis, which we're mostly addressing in my talk today. So these are clin uh, clinical approaches may not be used for PSC, but I have not seen any clinical trials for these approaches for PSC either. And always limited by the same problems we have with organ transplantation. One of the biggest issues with cell therapy for the liver is that the liver is so large. So the organ that we are all discussing today, largest internal organ in patients. We should ask ourselves how it got so large, which I mentioned later on, but in humans, it's about 200 billion cells. So I can tell you with certainty, we have no way in medicine. I've grown up 1 billion cells before, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, in the lab, trying to grow up a, a 1 billion stem cells injected in a cardiac stem cell therapy uh, at Stanford when I was there training. And that itself is crazy. 200 billion cells, it's a really large number. So scientists believe if you, re you can restore about 10% of the function 10% of 200 billion, so about 20 billion cells, uh, we can still live a comfortable life. You'd have enough liver functions to survive. And even that is a huge number. So um, a reason I'm pointing that out is I think that's a fundamental limitation we have to think about for cell therapy of the liver. So we might be able to do it in a mouse model, but as soon as we go to patient um, clinical studies, we have to rethink how to get cells in there, how to deliver them, how to get them to live, and, uh, live appropriately. So one of the issues I just mentioned earlier was with liver cells, which are these amazing cells with 500 known functions. Still, it's one area in medicine where they're discovering new functions of liver cells compared to other fields of medicine. The cells don't grow. So my uh, mentor, my PhD mentor, invented one of the only techniques we can even grow, uh, use to grow the liver cells long term. So if you put hepatocytes on a regular dish and you wait about a week, they're done. They've lost their phenotype. They look long and elongated, they no longer function. The, one of the first ways to do long-term culture was to put hepatocytes and sandwich them between gels, and this is the same time as this, actually many weeks later, you can wait out to six weeks, and you can still get these functional hepatocytes. So actually, drug companies use this technique. However, you notice the cells did not grow. These original cells I put down in the dish are still there later. So again, a basic problem in our field, if the liver cells really grew rapidly, we might be able to uh, get them from one donor, expand them, and try to figure out how to take this large number and get it in a patient. It doesn't work, they don't grow. There's a few studies that show growth, but it's, it's uh, very mild, it's not accepted in the field. So the same issues exist with cell therapy that I talked about with organ donation. So, did we really get very far? I, I still think there's some advantages to cell therapy, uh, but there's the limitations again. So um, 
I talked a little about the liver system, but I wanted to talk today uh, some exciting recent data in mouse studies of, uh, or animal studies with, with the actual bile duct. As, as you can see, the previous few slides were a little more focused on the hepatic tissue. So uh, scientists have recently figured out a couple models, actually uh, a little bit was mentioned earlier about organoid systems that model the liver uh, physiology. These are two mechanisms now. So we can take human bile ducts, which is a safe operation, removal of the gallbladder, quite a safe operation, collect cells off the gallbladder, put them in a um, organoid format uh, where we essentially culture them in gels, and we get these little structures that can be maintained long term. So, and these are human gallbladder samples. So now you have human gallbladder cells, or cholangiocytes rather, the lining of the cells in an organoid format. And um, we can also get them from scrapings of other aspects of the bile duct. So when we do procedures in medicine, we might, uh, that involve, uh, you know, uh, minimally invasive procedures to do imaging in the ducts, ERCP, et cetera. Uh, you might be able to scrape out ducts, uh, duct cells or other procedures in the liver and get actual gallbladder cells. So this could be done from patients with PSC. And what's interesting is you can do repair of gallbladder tissues. So primary sclerosis and cholangitis very often is, uh, we've seen it all weekend, you guys have been seeing it, it's a, a more often uh, extrahepatic biliary system that's affected, and of course later on intrahepatic. These are extrahepatic cells, and they are used to repair extrahepatic tissues. So this is the gallbladder in a mouse. The cells have been grown on a scaffold. There was a whole uh, tissue was taken out, and, a, and, the, and the scaffold was used to replace it. And what they found a couple weeks later is the green cells are the replaced cells. So this is an example of using human cholangiocytes to repair a gallbladder injury in a mouse. So one could think that we can use these types of approaches perhaps to build biliary systems in patients. It's not that far-fetched. These are human cells in a mouse immunodeficient model. And as you can see, all the mouse that got these human cells survived. This one is quite simple because if you have a hole in your gallbladder that did not repair, all the mice had biliary leaks and they died. The ones that had the human cells in that scaffold there repaired. So it's a very, it's a very big difference here between death and survival in the mouse but it's quite promising that it's human cells and it's uh, transplantation for biliary repair. Um, and the second model in the same study, this is 2017, so it's very recent, where this time they did uh, another injury that occurs very commonly when we do transplants um, in the clinic, which is just like kind of a bile duct ligation or bile duct injury model, where they, they severed the bile duct and they repaired it with a tube which contained the human uh, cholangiocytes. In this case, once they replaced the uh, severed duct with the tube, they got growth of the biliary cells once again and improved survival in the disease model. So these are two examples of, we're kind of doing cell therapy for the biliary duct with human cells still in mice mo mouse models. Um, the last thing, uh, there's a few other things we can do with these cells. So anytime, I, I feel uh, having done the training that I did, the best we can do in research is either use human cells um, in a culture dish or use human cells in some type of living system like a mouse. That's about as good as a model as we can do to study disease. So what's interesting here is I, the labels you might see. This is, these are, these are cholangiocytes from primary sclerosing cholangi uh, uh, cholangiocytes patients versus um, controls. And you can see here the PSC cells were not, have not grown. So they displayed markers of senescence. So this is an example of how we can use human cell culture to study the biology and possibly reverse mechanisms. There were a lot of mechanisms mentioned earlier in the previous talk. Um, in this case, they found the uh, PSC patient cells were not growing properly in the dish. So this is an example of what I would call using human cells for disease modeling. Uh, this is a long list of mouse models of primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So the current way we're developing drugs is either using clinical, either using clinical data or mouse models. So we do have mouse models, but th none of these have human tissue in them. I'll just mention that as a limitation. So uh, I believe we talked about the liver limitations, but I believe there's, believe there's some quite interesting, promising data on using human cholangiocytes, which is the lining of the 
cells of the extrahepatic biliary ducts such as the gallbladder and common ducts to actually reconstruct and grow cells back in um, mouse models and repair the biliary system. And that to me is something we might uh, think about in the future doing in patients with this, with this problem where you would have strictures and you have inflammation and maybe we just need to repair them. So it's just one uh, approach coming from a regenerative medicine approach. There still might be inflammation, et cetera, but at least we might be able to repair the ducts. So uh, the next topic is the one that I think would solve all the problems that we've mentioned and all the other limitations of all current studies, which is human stem cells, human stem cells. So there have already been about three Nobel Prizes given out for stem cell research. Um, I like to show this slide usually when I give this talk to students, but I realized that for human stem cells, I'm going to show a few slides just so everybody understands what human stem cells are. Uh, human pluripotent stem cells, these are the ones um, that I think are, have a high potential. And I think it's important for everyone to know how, how much potential there is for these cells. Um, three Nobel Prizes in the last 10 years or so, um, as well as, um, the, I'll just mention, embryonic stem cells were established 1981, actually at UCSF, the term was coined. Also, um, we used this technology to create all those, all those mouse models that I told you of primary scleros sclerosing cholangitis, all those disease models that are transgenic. We used stem cell technology to create all those. This was a Nobel Prize given in 2007. And most recently now, uh, I'll show you how the stem cells are produced in the first place so everybody understands it very quickly. But now we can create human stem cells from all of you, each one of you. I can get tissue samples and create a human stem cell from you. And it's very powerful because it's personalized uh, medicine and it's going to be precise for each individual. And that's where we think human stem cells not only be used for therapy, but used for diagnosis and understanding diseases. So it's a disease modeling and therapy with human stem cells. So there's lots of other applications of human stem cell I, I didn't want to get into, but cell therapy we're going to talk about today and a little bit about, uh, actually I don't even have the disease modeling application up here as well. So we can do cell therapy with stem cells. That's what people get excited about. It's what I'm excited about as well. But we can also use them for disease modeling, I just mentioned, and also just basic drug discovery. So um, individualized drugs for individual patients. Everybody here has a, a different genome, different ethnicity, different background. And to be honest, we're still figuring out in medicine how to handle the different genomes and how to develop drugs for different groups of people. And so human stem cells let, us, let me collect cells that have your DNA in them. So um, it's a great opportunity to do precision medicine. One way we created uh, stem cells before 1997, when we first isolated embryonic stem cells, before that, what we used to do is take a donor egg, remove the nucleus, take another cell, uh, any cell from another patient or the same patient, take the nucleus of a, out of that and stick it into the egg where we removed the, the egg's nucleus from. So now we had an egg with a, what's called a somatic nucleus. This was called nuclear transfer. This was hot when I started in this field. However, it's become an old technique because of the new technology I'm going to tell you about. But this was powerful because now the cells started dividing like a regular egg, and all of a sudden you get to this stage, and I can derive embryonic stem cells from this stage, and those cells can become any cell in the body. Oops. So essentially, what did I need for donors? I needed an egg, so I didn't destroy a fetus for this or uh, embryo, which I'm going to talk about next. And then I needed a cell, any cell from anywhere to get this nucleus, which contains the DNA. So this technique was powerful for creating embryonic stem cells about 15 years ago. The other technique that was more standard was <coughs> taking embryos that are already in a fertility clinic, but are destined to be thrown in the garbage. So to me, I think, uh, of course, California is pretty progressive with stem cells. But a place where I am right now, Buffalo, New York, is not necessarily in the community. But essentially, we're, for embryonic stem cells, we're taking things that would have been normally thrown in the garbage. And uh, these are four cell, two cell embryos. We can make them, we can grow them in the dish one or two cycles, collect cells, and derive embryonic stem cells. So my mentor in UCSF does this for a living. She derives embryonic stem cells, tries to make new lines. So again, these cells. 
They probably should have named it something else. This is not an embryo anymore. In fact, the cells that are grown are very different from the embryo, but they have some similarities because they can become any cell in the body. So it's very powerful, this cell right here. However, the last um, invention we came up with in the stem cells was very powerful. This was another UCSF scientist who now has uh, won, also won the Nobel Prize, and he was at Japan when he did the work, but he was affiliated with UCSF, so kind of back and forth. And what it's showing here is you can take any cell in the body, which is this green cell, I can take four factors, which are called transcription factors, things that bind DNA. I can add them to these cells and actually identify clones of what are, was mentioned earlier called an iPS cell. So right now, if I had samples from the patients here, I can create an iPS cell for everybody here, and now that cell could be used for you. So you can right away see two major problems are eliminated. I forgot to mention, I was so excited about embryonic stem cells, they are self-renewable. That's the difference between rechargeable battery and you know, gas. So we have self-renewable technology. That means I can grow them infinite capacity forever, embryonic stem cells. And now if I can make them from you, I don't have to worry about the immunosuppression or the immune problem. And if I uh, um, can make them using from any cell in the body, I don't have an ethical problem anymore. I don't require an egg donor. I don't require a, uh, a human embryo donor. So you can see why this invention was very powerful. So this is one of the most highest cited papers in science right now. So now let's get back on topic of how we can use stem cells uh, for PSC patients. So embryonic stem cell trials, uh, these are currently, as of 2015, or sorry, 2016, currently used. Now we don't see liver up here, right? So that's my job. But we have uh, retinal progenitor cells, Parkinson's for eye uh, diseases, Parkinson's, diabetes, et cetera. So I can guarantee you it's coming soon in the next five years. We just have to figure out some of the fundamental problems. So <clears throat> right now with pluripotent stem cells, when we try to make liver cells, they're not functionally equivalent. They make a lot less albumin than mature cells do. That's one way to think about a problem in the field. However, Various scientists have gone forward and used stem cells, made liver-like cells, and got them into the mouse, uh, into our mouse models. Those are immunodeficient mice that don't have an immune system. So you can see the green cells here are from human stem cells. Another group has made these little disks of stem cells that have blood uh, endothelial cells and other supporting tissue and have transplanted them in mouse models and showed they get lots of blood vessels and liver function. So we would call this ectopic liver tissue. So they can, so this is a scientist who's uh, in Cincinnati who's actually trying to do clinical trials in Japan using this approach. He's gonna take these little tiny discs, stick them in patients and use them to reverse liver uh, disease by providing liver functions. There's some limitations again because they, you don't get the mass effect that I told you about and he has not reported producing any biliary cells from these little discs. So the same cells should give rise to hepatocytes and the, and the biliary system. So it's still not there yet. The last technique is actually a scientist here, Dr. Willenbring, who was right next to me when I was working here training. He's shown that he can regenerate uh, human liver nodules and mouse systems. Um, the limitations, again, was the mass issue and they did not show biliary systems. They were showing liver systems. So there's still some work to be done. However, there's several papers recently using human stem cells to make cholangiocytes that we've been discussing today. These are four of them, that, uh, three of them here listed, but there's a few more. Uh, same as what I just mentioned, they can be differentiated forward towards these organon-like structures that express markers consistent with biliary ducts, and they can form both organoid structures and tubular structures, which are similar to what we see in the real gallbladder. So this is, these, are, these tissues can be used to test a lot of the drug candidates that were mentioned earlier, but also, ideally in my world, be used to figure out how to regenerate biliary tissue or use them back to regenerate biliary tissue in the liver, starting in mice. So the only thing that's been done with these so far that I could find was they were injected retrograde into the biliary duct, and you can see here that these are the human cells that have integrated. MHC1, is, they're using a human marker, have integrated in the bile duct short term. So there's a scientist, uh, 
the scientists here are listed who can integrate these cells into biliary ducts. That's as far as we've gone, 2015, but I can, I can assure you they're probably working on the next step right now. So in summary, um, pluripotent stem cells are self-renewable, so that means they can be grown infinitely. So that right away removes the problem of cell source and donor problems that I mentioned earlier. Um, they can be personalized and they can avoid the immune response um, so right away, and there's no ethical issue, so it's very exciting. Uh, there are some in vivo results that I just mentioned with liver and biliary systems. I think there's a big future here on what to do next, which is our lab is interested in these problems right here. Um, I was gonna quickly present decellularized grass. I'm gonna give about two minutes here. So another area which I didn't mention yet, another way to, and I did talk about this last year, was you could take donor livers which are not able to be transplanted. They're not good enough to be transplanted and you could remove all the cells from them and keep the scaffold, replace cells back into these scaffolds, liver cells, and you would have an organ that could be transplanted into patients. So this is a technique that developed in, a, in around 2008 or so and so there are scientists who work on this approach. I think there's some limitations which have to do with primarily trying to reseed. So this is what your scaffold looked like when you remove all the cells. So you, now you try to inject cells back in and you can see there's gonna be gaps and, and so far, because the liver is so big, it's been very difficult to recellularize, to re-put in cells back in. Those cells could be, the cells we put back in the scaffold could be from stem cells. So in theory, if we had these donor organs, you could just, even cadavers, you could just take them remove the cells, put in cells, cells from stem cells, and maybe have new organs that could be transplanted. So there's some very smart people working on it. I don't work in this area, but it's another possibility. They're working in mouse and rat models, but the human liver, again, I just mentioned to you, is so large. So that is going to be the problem. How do you reseed a human liver? Um, and the last questions I'll leave you with is what we're trying to do in the lab. We're trying to address all these issues in one shot. We're trying to say that mass is a huge issue. How can you account for the mass of the liver? Microarchitecture, macroarchitecture, mature liver and biliary systems, and the blood vessels as well. And basically, we think we have to copy what happens during development. I'll probably will end on this slide. We have some data from my lab, uh, probably not necessary to show you guys. Uh, you guys have been listening to a lot of talks today. But generally, in eight days in the mouse, the liver goes from about 1,000 cells to the largest organ. So if we can use stem cells to model liver organ formation, we might be able to do this in patients and try to build liver tissue in patients. So what we cannot, no scientist can do right now, happens in nature in eight days in a mouse and about uh, three weeks in humans. So right away, if we can make liver tissue, this has got all the architecture, all the biliary systems, it's got everything. So that's how we're thinking about using stem cells right now. We're trying to figure that out and um, you know, we have some uh, data from our lab, et cetera, with human stem cells. I'll just show one picture from what my students did a lot of work on. So right now we're transplanting these cells into mice, and so far we don't get too much liver-like structures, but we have begun, and I expect uh, a year from now we'll have a lot more data. And we're hoping to see liver structures and biliary structures. I'll just show uh, we can make liver-like cells in the lab. Um, we're working on the biliary cells with a collaborator at University of Toronto. Benita Kamath, uh, who is an expert also in PSC. Um, and um, the biliary uh, tract is the next project we're working on. And um, anyways, this is my uh, lab group at uh, Buffalo. On the left here, many of the students working on these projects. And here they're explaining their projects to undergrads. Um, this is our campus. Just wanted to acknowledge uh, many of my former mentors, et cetera, and our students in the lab. And I will take any questions.